Okay, so welcome everybody to one of our seminars here in CFT. Today we have Lucas Tendik directly from uh, INRIA, Paris, Saclay. And Lucas did his PhD in Dusseldorf last year under the supervision of Professor Dagmar Bruce. And now he's a postdoc there in Paris, Saclay. And today he's going to talk about distributed quantum incompatibility. Lucas, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And the screen is yours. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for the nice introduction. And of course, also for, for the invite in the first place to everyone who's involved in, in the organization and to everyone who's listening. So as Alexandre said, I'm now at uh, INRIA in Paris Saclay. And before you see it here from the logo, uh, I, was in, uh, I was in Düsseldorf with, with Dagmar. And well, this is the paper I'm talking about is sort of the last thing that came out of my PhD, uh, which is about quantum incompatibility. And um, feel free to interrupt me as much as you want during, during the presentation. Um, ask a lot of questions if you want. Um, you can see my pointer, I guess, and you can see the screen in, in full screen mode. Um, maybe just give me a quick feedback because I... Yes, yes, we can. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Then let's start. Maybe just this picture here, just to see something about uh, like a graphical representation of what you will, will see later. So don't worry about too much about this picture for now. Good. Um, what do I want to talk about is quantum incompatibility, which is maybe not really well defined what it exactly means. But what I mean under this is I want to talk mostly about measurements and the measurement incompatibility. On a very high level, without any mathematical description, it means we have a measurement box where I can perform different, different measurements, like here labeled by X, I have different buttons to push. And then whenever I push one button, I get an outcome A. For instance, here, this lamp uh, is shining. Uh, this is a typical setup which you have in, in, in a lot of scenarios. And then we have, I want to ask the question, can we somehow simulate this box with a lot of different measurements with a box that only has one input, so one measurement direction, and something that, that's additionally, this would be some classical post-processing of the outcomes. And why this is interesting is this is also relevant for, for quantum steering, which is a scenario where we have Alice and Bob in some labs that, that are maybe far away from each other. And they want to certify that, for instance, they, they share an entangled state. And in this scenario, Bob is fully trusting his measurement device. So he has full control. And in particular, he can do state tomography. But Alice does not trust her measurement device at all. She does not want to assume anything about it. Um, so we just have this kind of, of black box where we just see what button we push and, um, and what outcomes we get. And this notion of incompatibility, we will see this later, is very relevant for steering. In particular, it's necessary. Uh, and then we have a similar thing for, for non-locality where Bob also doesn't trust his measurement device at all. Um, we have now a black box on Alice's and Bob's side. They still want to certify maybe that the state is entangled, but maybe also some properties of the measurements. And yeah, well, what we can learn about the measurements also will get us to learn something about non-locality and steering. Good. Um, I want to explain a little bit where the title of our work comes from, what's the inspiration, even though the framework we use will be completely different. And this is distribution of quantum resources. So for instance, we can look at entanglement, which in the easiest form is just defined on like two, uh, a bipartite state. And then we can characterize the entanglement of the state. But a lot of notions that are interesting appear just when we look at the more constituents of, of the system. Let's say, for instance, three parties. And there's this very famous result by, by Wouters and co-workers, um, well, almost 25 years ago. Uh, which shows us that entanglement is sort of uh, monogamous, meaning, well, here on the left side, this would be the concurrence, but more in general, if we have a state that's highly entangled between A and B, 
then A and C cannot be highly entangled because it's upper bounded by the entanglement of A with the bipartition B and C. In particular, if we have a maximally entangled state between A and B, um, Charlie cannot be entangled at all with the state. And this is not the only example which we have. We also have a similar result for non-locality by F.S. Rata and Tuna, where they show that the violation of the CHSH inequality squared um, also behaves monogamously in the sense that, well, if you reach a value of two squared of two, then you have to reach a value of, of zero basically in the other in the other case. Finally, also in the coherence of, this, of, of quantum states, um, you can partition the coherence in some global contribution and some local contribution. And what all these three works have in common, sort of, they look at free parties, like here, free systems, and they, they make some cuts and try to understand some of the notion of how one system compared with the other two together behave or what you get in addition by having this third system in addition. I will talk about local quantum measurements, so completely forget about, for this talk, the mathematical structure of like multipartite entanglement and so on. Uh, it's just like a motivation for, for the title, let's say. And then what do I mean by distribution of measurement incompatibility? Let's say we have three measurements, M1, M2, and M3. And in this graphical representation, this black circle here just represents the incompatibility of all three of them together. So everything I can say about M1, M2, M3 in terms of incompatibility in total. And what we, what we want to understand is how, what we can learn about this total incompatibility by looking up at the subset. So for instance, how incompatible M1 and M2 are, M1 and M3, M2 and M3, what we can infer from this and also how it limits the global incompatibility in a sense. As an example for three measurements, M1, M2, M3, we can have that all of them are jointly measurable by, by a single measurement. So when our box just has one input, which would be this, this red circle here. Um, but we can also have that just two out of the three measurement directions are jointly measurable, which would be these bigger circles. For instance, here measurement direction one and two are jointly measurable, here one and three, and here two and three. Then we can talk about the intersection of all of them, which would be that the states are, that the measurements are um, measurable, uh, jointly measurable in every uh, bipartition in the sense that um, two out of three are always jointly measurable. And we can also look at the convex hull of this set. So if you're not even if you're not even able to write this probabilistically at something that's jointly measurable in two out of three measurements. The main questions we want to answer are how does the incompatibility of the whole assemblage, so just a set of the measurements, depend on the incompatibility of its subsets, and also how much can we gain in terms of like resource, if we consider incompatibility as a resource, how much can we gain by adding more measurements to our measurement scheme? Good. Um, I want to make a very short introduction to measurement incompatibility um, just for, for the sake if someone is not super familiar for it. So in the quantum mechanics lecture, we usually learn about the Heisenberg-Robertson uncertainty relation, meaning the the product of the standard deviation of, of two observables is lower bounded by some function on the commutator, meaning there the non-commutativity or commutativity of observables is the main notion, meaning that if these two commute, so if this is actually zero, we can measure them jointly, and if not, then not. Um, and since we're talking of, about observables by the spectral decomposition, this notion just concerns about projective measurements. Meaning we talk here just about projective measurements. Uh, and how, at least how I learned about this in the quantum mechanics lecture in my lecture was that this is kind of a limitation of your, of your well, how certain you can be. And also that you just consider two measurements and not what happens for more measurements. Now in quantum information, we have quite a different view of, of this. Um, we look at this in terms of joint measurability. So for joint measurability, we have some PUVMs or PUVMs effects, M give A given X, where A is the outcome, X is 
the, the input. And we say the set is jointly measurable if we can simulate it by a parent BUVM G lambda, which after obtaining the outcome lambda, we just output A with some probability given that we know this label X, which we want to simulate. We can also see it as some kind of marginalization of a big parent POVM, uh, which I will show on the, on the next slide. Uh, the left side is maybe more steering inspired or non-locality inspired, but the right side is uh, also nice to see. Uh, and in pictures, it is exactly this, that you have one box with just one POVM, which would be this G lambda to simulate the whole thing on the left side. And it turns out that this is somehow the generalization of what non-commutativity means to POVMs. Uh, I will let, show you in a minute an example of, of POVMs that are jointly measurable but not commuting. And what we see in previous works is that uh, this is actually a resource for quantum information processing tasks. Like if you want to do state discrimination or exclusion, it can be helpful. It is necessary for non-locality and even sufficient for steering in a sense. Uh, and also in cryptography, if you think of the BB84 protocol, you want to use measurements in the computational and in the plus minus basis, basically using the incompatibility of, of mutually unbiased bases there. And this has been like a topic which was relevant in, in the past years, but you can also see that there's already a review by Heino Sari and co-workers from 2016 but also a quite recent review from 2013 from Ortfried Grüner and, and co-workers. Um, if everything is good on your side, let's go to the canonical example, which is basically in all of these talks, um, which is noisy Pauli measurements. So let's consider two Pauli measurements um, in the X and in the Z direction, where we have some noise parameter lambda and our outcomes are plus minus for each of these. Now, we can see that if lambda is one, we just have projective measurements. We can just talk about the uh, uh, non-commutativity of these measurements. And if, eta is z uh, if, if lambda is zero, we just measure twice a uh, coin flip, and this should be jointly measurable. And somewhere in between, there should be a threshold. So let's consider the assemblage, which is just a set of these POVMs for a technical reason that will become clear later. I, write it as an ordered list. And then I propose the following parent POVM, which is given like this, which has four outcomes, S and T, going here from plus and mother to minus one. Um, and it also has contributions in both directions, the X and the Z direction. And also it has this parameter lambda. And we can check then that the marginalization um, works well. So if we forget about one of the two outcome channels, S or T, by summing over them, we recover either of the measurements. Um, and this means we also fulfill the completeness relation, but we also have to check that this parent POVM is actually a positive operator uh, or a set of positive operators, which is only the case of eta is in this interval zero to one over square root of two. Means we have just shown that these are these measurements, this, noisy x and z measurements are jointly measurable if eta is in this interval and actually you can also show that this is the best you can do so this is optimal but these measurements are clearly uh, non-commuting unless eta is uh, equal to zero uh, an intuitive picture which i took here from this work from from Roko Uola and co-workers um, you have the measurement direction a1 and a2 which might be x and z direction you construct sort of two measurement directions, B2, B1, and you randomly just perform one of them and assign an outcome to both of these, which effectively gives you a convex combination of both, for, for instance, here, this measurement direction with a shrunken block vector. So this is plain old incompatibility of two measurements. Let's go to the incompatibility of multiple, which for this talk mostly will be free. Uh, we'll talk later about some generalizations, but you can get the main idea of, uh, by looking at free measurements. Here we have the picture again, which I talked about in the introduction. And as I said, an assemblage is just uh, from, for me an ordered list of POVMs. 
and jointly measurable means this parent PVM plus some post-processing. And then we can define jointly measurable pairs where measurement one and two are jointly measurable, one and three, two and three, and so on. We can talk about pairwise jointly measurable measurability, which would be this intersection here. And we can also talk about genuine triple-wise incompatibility, which means if you cannot write your measurements as a convex combination of any of these sets here. And the intuitive idea is that this somehow counts how many measurements you really need to perform. For instance, in this red dot, you just need one measurement. In these bigger circles, you need two. And if you are outside, in a sense, you need three. We can look again at an example, the X, Y, and Z measurements, uh, given like this. So now we just with a different uh, noise parameter, eta, to not confuse with the RQ lambda here. Um, they are jointly measurable if eta is below 1 over square root of 3, so we just need one measurement in this case. They are pairwise jointly measurable, we saw this before already, if eta is below 1 over square root of 2. And they are German triplewise incompatible if eta is above well, roughly 0.8. So we can play with these structures. And what is kind of interesting is that this also leads to observational results. Sort of if you look at Bell inequalities, for instance, uh, here in this work by Marco Tullio and co-workers, um, you see that the amount of how much you can violate a Bell inequality given that your measurements obey some of these uh, um, incompatibility structures, um, you, will, yeah, you will see you can uh, recognize this in the violation of a Bell inequality. Um, for instance, they, they have here this, this table, which uh, you don't have to understand in its full capacity. Basically, they look at a bunch of, of inequalities. Uh, they write down the local bound, which is here normalized to zero, and the no signaling bound, which is normalized to one. Um, the violation on the qubit space and on the third level of the so-called NPA hierarchy. And then in between, uh, what you can get with different incompatibility structures. So for instance, if uh, you have pairwise compatible measurements, some of these measurements you cannot violate at all, some you can just violate, but not to the maximal amount. Uh, particularly interesting here is maybe, maybe this case, where you cannot violate this inequality with any of these incompatibility structures, unless you have really generally free measurements, even if you don't assume that quantum mechanics holds, so even if you're just looking at no signaling distributions. Good. Um, apart from this, surprisingly little is known about sort of how this whole business is with, I add some measurements, how incompatible I get. So there's some numerical work by, by Jessica Bavarescu uh, where, they, where they looked at some projective measurements, it's like, labeled by n the number of the measurements and they are either a planar so just in in one um in let's say the xz uh sphere uh, not sphere circle plane or you have just some general um, measurements or some sets that sort of evenly distribute your measurements over the block sphere and they look at how noise robust they are but the, well, this is some numerics, which gives us an idea of what's happening, but it does not really tell us some of the physics that's going on. And there's also an analytical work for mutually unbiased bases, uh, looking at the noise robustness in, in, in a sense. Uh, again, uh, analytically characterizing this by, well, looking very directly at the structure of MUBs. So this also gives you only limited amount of idea what's happening physically. There's one other work um, here, which tells us something more generally, which is any of these incompatibility structures, where this now is some, some uh, hypergraph notation, um, where for instance here measurement of what one and four would be compatible because we have an edge between them, or two and one are compatible also because there is an edge. We can think of all uh, of these structures and what, what they show, have shown is that in quantum mechanics, we can realize all of them. Um, so this is maybe the only general result of, that was known before. So what do we? Um, we go away from these 
noise robustness uh, measures and look at a different quantifier and look what it can tell us generally about what the subsets of some assemblage tell us about the incompatibility as a, as a whole. Um, we look at this quantifier, which I will explain in a minute, which was introduced in a previous paper by us together with uh, Martin Klisch. So what's the idea of this uh, quantifier? So we um, have a measure and prepare channel, which we use to associate to every POVM just one channel, which is a one-to-one -one mapping. Uh, excuse me for a second. Yes. Um, so, so we map the problem from sort of distances between POVMs to distances between channels, where we yeah, just measure on the state and then put out a, a flag state A. And the nice thing is if we have channels, there's a canonical choice of a distance, um, a very natural choice, which would be the diamond distance, which is given like this, um, where we basically measure the distance between two states, rho after applying lambda one and rho after applying lambda two on just one subsystem of the state row, because we make use of that we can use entanglement. And then we take the one norm. So operationally, it just means we want to distinguish two channels by applying them on, the, on one part of a state. Then we get out the corresponding state after the channel evolution, and then we measure and have to guess which channel was applied, either one or two. And this guessing probability is completely determined by, by the diamond distance. So there's an operational interpretation of the diamond distance. And then what, what we are doing is we take the diamond distance between two POVMs and to incorporate then the whole assemblage, we sum over all settings X and also introduce this probability PX, which you can think of as it's the probability with which we would push one of these buttons X in an experiment. So we talk more about this, the properties of this tuple now of our assemblage and its probabilities P. So this sum then will give us a distance between an assemblage M with this probability P and an assemblage F with this probability P. And then we can just minimize over, over a set F, which is joint imaginable. And this gives us a distance based quantifier. Lucas, can I, can I have a question? Yeah, sure. So why does uh, why why are you using the diamond distance and not any other uh, we, can, we, we, we can use also other measures that actually works with other measures. So we will tell you in a minute basically that we don't need the specific properties of the diamond distance. What's kind of nice is when we do use the diamond distance is that you can also calculate it efficiently via SDPs which if you have a different distance might not be the case you can use something like um, the operator norm between pvms like the infinity norm or something like this this also works which we also introduced this in this work um, it's just that this seems to have the nicest connection to steering to like steering measures and seems to have the nicest operational interpretation, but it's not a unique choice at all between like distances between sets of POVMs. Okay, thank you. Good. Um, then yeah, let's come to the relevant properties of this quantifier, which I, I mentioned here again. So first of all, it's a monotone under the application of quantum channels, meaning if I play a quantum channel on my, on my POVMs in the Heisenberg picture, um, which you can see as applying the corresponding uh, dagger channel in, in the Schrodinger picture on the state, uh, it should not increase because in the resource fear of incompatibility, whenever I have a parent POVM and then I, I want to apply this channel lambda dagger onto my measurements, just the lambda dagger on my parent POVM will also be a valid parent POVM. So we want this function to not increase under the action of these channels, which it does not. And there you just use properties of the diamond distance. Um, it's also a monotone on a classical simulation. 
So if I have an assemblage M and I want to use it to simulate an assemblage M prime, just by choosing with a certain probability one of my measurements X and then measuring it and outputting the classical output B, given that I've actually measured A, it also decreases or at least not increases under these operations. If you like to think more in terms of pictures, this would be the corresponding picture. So we put in a state row, we choose with a certain probability what kind of measurement we want to perform, given that we know we want to simulate Y. We perform the actual measurement, get some outcome, and then have some classical post-processing. Um, furthermore, that's the whole point. It inherits the properties of a distance. We will basically later derive all the results by just using the triangle inequality. Um, which is surprisingly simple, but uh, as I will show, also quite powerful. Furthermore, what we need is that we have a convex combination over single settings, meaning we have here the sum explicitly being a convex combination over each setting. And we don't have a, I don't know, very convoluted distance that incorporates all these settings into a single distance somehow. We really see it that we compare distances uh, for each setting. And furthermore, um, this is also appealing. It's efficiently computable via SDPs. Um, and we can use the whole machinery of semi-definite programming to derive bounds by looking at the primal and the dual. Finally, as I showed you before on the other, on, on the other slide, the diamond distance has an operational interpretation. So we can think of this whole, whole thing as some average measurement distinguishability measure between an incompatible uh, assemblage M and the whole set of jointly measurable assemblages F. Good. Let's come to a first incompatibility bound. So we take again this measure, and just for simplicity, we take this probability distribution Px to be uh, uniformly distributed. I show you later in the slide that this is really just for the convenience of pres the presentation. Uh, and let's look at an assemblage which might be here. And instead of co computing directly the distance to, to the set of jointly measurable assemblages uh, JM, where I denote the closest element here by, by putting a hash onto it, we do a detour to de this point and then do uh, the triangle inequality. Uh, I will have to introduce for this later some notation, but first of all, this is the general triangle inequality, which follows from the distance properties of the diamond distance with respect to some point n, one, two, three, so some assemblage of three measurements. And now we have to choose a clever middle point to learn some physics of, out of this. And what we do is we do a concatenation of ordered lists where we don't do anything to the third measurement. So this is, will be exactly the same in N as in M. But for the first two measurements, we replace them by the closest jointly measurable measurements when I would just consider measurements M1 and N2 with each per performed with probability one half. So also uniformly distributed. So this is some element which lives in the set here. And now we want to evaluate this triangle inequality. And what's happened is that this red part will exactly evaluate to this, right, uh, to this red part here. So to two third of the incompatibility of measurement one and two. And this two third you can see as the probability that I would choose measurement one and two out of the three options, one, two, three. Plus we have this blue part, which is the incompatibility of, of this concatenated assemblage list here, which gives a contribution just due to the presence of the third measurement, because by design measurement one, two hash are jointly measurable. So what we can see is that the measurement assemblage involving all three measurements, one, two, three, is upper bounded by the incompatibility of one, two times the probability that we use a measurement out of one, two out of all of them, out of one, two, three, plus the incompatibility that's there due to the presence of the third measurement, even if one and two would be compatible. And what I want to argue from this, and this is sort of a more polygamous behavior, 
contrary to, so instance, monogamous behavior of, of entanglement. Because what we see here is that if we want to have high incompatibility of the measurements one, two, three, we need high incompatibility also in the subset. And there's nothing special about one, two, it could also be two, three. Plus, we even we also need incompatibility of the measurement that we add, in this case, let's measurement three, with the parent POVM that approximates measurement one and two as good as possible. Good. Um, if there's no question regarding this, I would uh, come, I think, to the second bound. Okay. Uh, otherwise, feel free to ask questions. I can also skip back. And the second bound involves something which I call the incompatibility gain. What we do for this is, there it comes in handy that we write these as an ordered list. Uh, I split my measurements into two copies of each other. So instead of saying ah, I perform measurement one, two, three, each with a probability one third, I have an assemblage of six measurements, each performing with a probability of one over six. Uh, and well, two of them happen to be the same always. What I can use is that this measure is invariant under this. So I use measure, uh, I can see that the incompatibility of M123 is just the incompatibility of, of this copied version. And I can also relabel the measurements or reorder them. And then I can again I apply the triangle inequality in this object here on the right side and have to choose a clever middle point to learn some physics again. And what I choose in this set, uh, case is a concatenated list again for, for this n here, which is the concatenation of the closest jointly measurable assemblage for the measurements one, two, with the closest jointly measurable assemblage for the measurements one, two, uh, one, three, and two, three. So this is an assemblage of six measurements where this pair is jointly measurable, this pair is jointly measurable, and this pair is jointly measurable, but overall they could still be incompatible. And then what we learn is that the incompatibility of measurement one, two, three is upper bounded by the average incompatibility we have in the subsets, plus this incompatibility, which sort of tells you how incompatible are the parent POVMs for each of these sets if the parent PVMs is just something that approximates two measurements uh, as well as possible with just one measurement. And then we can, by let's say, assuming measurement one and two are the most incompatible ones, we, we can define something which I call the incompatibility gain, which is just the difference of the incompatibility of all three measurements minus measurement one and two. And we see it's upper bounded by the incompatibility of, of this n. And I will later show that even if it's very simple tools, uh, these incompatibilities are tied in relevant scenarios. Um, I have note that this incompatibility n is not really exactly the incompatibility of the parent POVMs, uh, but we can upper bound it by the incompatibility of the free parent POVMs for these subsets. Again, this is sort of more hinting of, of like a polygamous behavior. So what we really want is a lot of measurements that are each pairwise a lot of uh, incompatible with each other and not something more monogamous in entanglement, which might be very intuitively because, well, if you have a lot of measurements that, that you cannot measure jointly, pairwise even you, the whole set, you should also not be able to measure jointly with one measurement or even approximate it. So let's come to some example, which uh, here will again be just noisy poly measurements. So what, what you have seen before, where we have some noise parameter eta. And we have now two measurements, M1 and M2. It does not really matter how we order them due to the symmetry of the Pauli measurements. And then we also have this measurement with the hash 1, 2, which just means it's the concatenation of the closest jointly measurable um, assemblage with this parameter eta plus this third measurement where we don't change anything. And then we can look at this inequality and we, we get this plot. So this purple line here is just the incompatibility of measurement one, two, three together, depending on this parameter eta. 
So we can see when eta is roughly 0.58, they start to become incompatible, and then it grows linearly. We can also see in this blue line here, which is like a rescaled version of the uh, incompatibility of just two out of the three measurements, they start to become incompatible at one over square root of two, and then it grows linearly. And this red line here is somehow this, this term due to the presence of the third term, which has these kinks uh, where it becomes uh, pair, pairwise uh, incompatible and incompatible in general. Um, and the blue and the red line here, actually, they add up to the purple line. Uh, and we can show this analytically, so we can show that the tightness holds. What we use for this is that we know a lot about the incompatibility and the parent PVMs for Pauli measurements. Uh, and then, then we can also look at the primal and the dual version of, of the STP and retrieve an analytical solution. Actually, we can solve or show tightness for, for more cases. So this is not just, I don't know, some easy case we look at where it works. But actually, when we have just mutually unbiased bases, so generalization of higher dimension for to higher dimensions of what the Pauli measurements are, and we go from whenever they exist to two from two measurements to d measurements uh, for for MUBs. Um, let's say, uh, for instance, we we have some construction uh, for for prime dimension d. Um, we can show whenever we go from two to d measurements or from two to d plus one in some generalization of this inequality, which I will show you later or from D to D plus one, we can also show tightness there. So even though we're using very simple tools, um, it seems to work very well, which tells you something about the structure of incompatible mutually unbiased bases that they align very nicely in the space of, of all assemblages. Let's come to the second example, which is about this incompatibility game. Uh, we look again at noisy Pauli measurements and we look at this inequality, respectively this for, for the incompatibility gain. This is just what I introduced before at the, uh, at the uh, other slide. Here it would just be the difference of the incompatibility with three measurements compared to what I had already when I had measurement one and two. And we get, we get again a similar plot. So the purple and the blue line, actually they did not change up to the fact that the blue line was before scaled with a factor of two third. And the red line um, is sort of what we have due to the presence of this, uh, this N. And again, we can see here that the blue and the red line, that they add up to the purple line. Not only you can see this in the graph, but here again, the, the tightness can be shown analytically. Um, if I remember correctly in the paper, we did not check for the other cases, but I would somehow suspect that also for higher dimensional and MUBs, this would work. Good. Um, if there are no questions, then I would continue with uh, with this. But maybe are there some questions up to now? Um, well, if it's not the case, I, I just go on. You can stop me at any time. Just let me know you're still there, I guess. Oh, you can you can continue. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, we can also get bounds just from the incompatibility structures, which is something very obvious. So once we use the the triangle inequality for one time, we can also apply it multiple times, like drawn here in this picture. Uh, meaning we can also up about the total incompatibility by its genuine triple-wise incompatibility, just like the distance to this convex hull here, plus the pairwise incompatibility, just the distance to where every pair out of the three is compatible, plus the so-called hollow incompatibility, where here every pair is compatible, but not all of them together, to the set where really all of them together are generally measurable. And again, um, we can show that this is tied for Pauli measurements, and we checked at least numerically for, for higher dimensional MUBs, and it also seems to be tied there. 
So somehow all those very simple bounds we used, they seem to apply nicely to MDBs, which is sort of the canonical case which you are interested in if you're look at, looking for highly incompatible measurements. Good, uh, let's talk about some generalizations on, on the slide here. So first of all, we can look at more measurements. So if I have now M instead of three measurements, and I take a subset C with cardinality, well, uh, here with, with the absolute value of C denoted, I can derive a similar bound like this. Um, where So and I'm not limited to adding, adding one measurement. I can just look at M measurements and the subset C out of them. I can also look instead of just one subset of multiple disjoint subsets, CI, and see that the incompatibility of my M measurements is upper bounded by sort of the average incompatibility of each of these subsets, plus the incompatibility of what's essentially the parent PVMs to each of the subsets. So this all behaves nicely in the generalizations. And we can also define this gain when I add one measurement from just going from M to M plus one, it will be the same sort of just generalize, generalizing the notion of this N, which I had before, just being the concatenation of all of the subsets. We can also talk about non-uniform uh, input distributions. So before we always took uh, the distribution P of X to be one over M, but we can also take like a general distribution P, apply the triangle inequality, and then when we evaluate this distance from M to N, we just get sort of the weighted probability that P1 and P2, that, that we have measurement one and two, and renormalize Q. So this all works fine. And this really shows you that somehow it's what's relevant is the incompatibility of the subset you're interested in. Here it would be one and two with the probability that you would choose out of them. And then, well, here would be some Q, which might be not so clear what it means, but we can also exchange Q by being by the optimal distribution that somehow maximizes the incompatibility uh, of this assemblage M and, and it still all works perfectly fine. So all these simple tools, they, they generalize. Now I wanted to talk in the very beginning already about steering and uh, yeah, it's finally the time for that. Uh, so in steering, we have with this scenario where Alice has a black box, Bob has a perfect control over his measurement device. And we are looking at these conditional states, sigma, um, after Alice measured uh, with her POVM and traced out where sigma is conditioned uh, on X and we have the outcome A. And all the information about the steering scenario is in the set of these sigmas. So we can look at the steering assemblage, which also here I just write as a ordered list of these sigma x. And what, what we're interested in is sort of, this is the mathematical structure um, of, of, of these sigmas where you can see this as a no signaling constraint that Bob should not be able to guess the label of, of x if uh, he's unaware of the outcome A. And the central question in steering is whether there's a local hidden state model it's very similar to a local hidden variable model in Bell non-locality, where Alice answers according to this response function P, and uh, Bob just receives these state sigma lambda. And if such a model exists, then Bob, the, uh, there's no reason for Bob to believe that they share an entangled state. And also there's no reason for, Alice, for Bob to believe that Alice can actually perform incompatible measurements. So for Bob, it looks like Alice is just performing one measurement and some classical post-processing all the time. Now we can also quantify steering by, by this quantifier here, which was introduced in this previous work by, by Q et al. And here it's very similar to the quantifier we introduced before. We have also some probability distribution Px, which I already substituted here with one over M. And then we have the distance between these state assemblages in the one norm, so in the trace norm, not the diamond norm anymore. Um, and excuse me again for one second. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry for that. Um, 
what we have to do for like a technical condition is um, we don't just minimize with respect to the local hidden states uh, set, so which would be described like this, but by the consistent local hidden state uh, set, which means the tau, if we sum over A, should have the same marginal state as, as sigma. This is just for if we do a concatenation of steering assemblages, we don't have, we don't want to have any signaling involved. And then it's exactly the same formalism. We can use exactly the same properties and we end up with in inequalities for steering. Um, for like steering assemblages where we can learn something similar to incompatibility. And it's so similar, I don't even show the equations. Um, we can also learn something about non-locality. And I think this is the more interesting case because there's actually, I think, something new happening which is also related to an open question that I have. So non-locality, Alice and Bob have a black box and the central object is this probability distribution Q given A, B given X, Y. Uh, meaning we look at, at this behavior where here this index one, two, three means and considering Alice has three measurements and Bob always has the same number of measurements. I, I don't really care how many measurements Bob has. And then, well, this, the question we can ask, is there a local hidden variable model or not? So can we violate a bell inequality or not? And again, we can do this in a more quantitative way, which would be this quantifier, which has also been introduced before, which again looks very similar. So we are, can have some probability distribution, which I substituted here already with one over MA and B, where MA is the number of measurements for Alice and B for Bob. And then we take the classical L1 distance between probability distributions, Q and T. And again, we don't just take the, the simple distance with respect to the local uh, probabilities, which would be given like here, but we have some consistency condition, which is that the marginal distribution of T, if we sum over A or over B, is the one which we also get if we do the same over Q, just to avoid any um, signaling in the, in the framework. And then we can apply the same formalism and we get inequalities which look very similar. So which would be here the non-locality of the distribution with measurement one, two, three is upper bounded by the non-locality where Alice now only uses two out of her three measurements plus the non-locality of a distribution where Alice actually use all three measurements, but one and two lead to a local distribution. And the non-locality is just there due to the presence of the non-locality of, of Alice's third measurement with the parent measurement of one and two. So this is really just the non-locality being there due to the third measurement. And we can also do the same for, for this average. And I think this average is very interesting because it's intuitively at least, and I have an example on the next slide, more constrained than what we have in the steering or incompatibility scenario. Um, so let's go maybe to this. So the question is, does non-locality behave differently? So we look at this average subset non-locality and we consider now a dichotomic Bell scenario where Alice has three settings uh, and Bob only two. And in this scenario, the whole non-locality quantifier we can relate to the violation of the CHSH inequality. The higher the violation for the CHSH inequality, the higher this um, non-locality quantifier will be. Essentially because the CHSH inequality is the only facet of the local polytope in this case, which is interesting. So we have here the CHSH inequality uh, indexed by some ij, where ij is just uh, the tuple of Alice's measurement choice, one, two, one, three, or two, three. So for each of the subsets, we can look at uh, an, an inequality, meaning we get an, we can look at all three together and sort of the average CHSH violation. If Alice uses two out of uh, three measurements and the state and Bob's measurement never change. And it's easy to compute the local bound and we can also consider the quantum bound. And the interesting thing here is the quantum bound which is four times square root of two plus two over three. 
This is strictly lower than two square root of two. Um, meaning we can violate two out of these three inequalities, but then we are local in the third one. Just because uh, for the violation, for instance, you need, let's say, sigma x and sigma z on Alice's side, maybe for measurement one and two. And then if you want to violate with measurement one and three, you the two and three essentially have to be the same measurement. But then you will end up with some local correlations uh, for the third option. And this is somehow different from what we have seen for incompatibility. Because there, if you look at the three Paulis, sigma x, sigma y, sigma z, the incompatibility of each with each other, so this average subset non-locality, would exactly be the incompatibility of just looking at one and two or one and three. But here, if I look at the subset non-locality, it's strictly smaller than the maximal non-locality of, of any of the subsets. And there's an open question, which I find kind of interesting. Um, does there exist a better non-local game than the CHS edge inequality? Non-local game is basically just a Bell inequality rescaled and which also takes into consideration with which probability I choose a certain input. And this quantifier n, which I showed you on the previous slide, is actually in one-to-one -one correspondence with the optimal non-local game you can play. And what is somehow a bit hidden in these two papers by, by Brito and uh, Araujo and their co-workers is they looked at non-local games and they could not find a better game than the CHSH game uh, when you only have two outcomes. Uh, meaning in their work, it somehow shows you that if you use more settings, if you want to optimal non-local game, what you should do is never use more measurements or more than two measurements. And I want to understand why. So why is the CHSH inequality quality so unreasonably good? Because this is not the case in steering and in, uh, in incompatibility. That's very easy to be better with three measurements than with two. But for non-locality, it kind of seems hard. And this would be maybe one idea to see why, because this upper bound here is kind of stronger than in these cases. Of course, we have this distribution from this non-locality of this, of, of this distribution T, um, which uh, we, we have to understand better. But sort of my, my hope is a bit that this is a, such a strong constraint when you add more and more measurements that it will tell you that you can essentially not do better than CHSH if you consider non-local games. Okay. Um, uh, hi, sorry. Yes. Uh, before I go to summary, because I didn't get it. In what way, like, what do you mean by there is no better? Because this is what I didn't get. Like, like, okay. Yeah. So um, let's go maybe one slide back. So we have here this uh, quantifier, uh -huh. which here I took for given that the distribution of the inputs x and y is uniformly distributed. Uh -huh. Then you can look at how non-local your distribution is. And what you do is sort of, if you would always have it uniformly distributed, what you observe in these two uh, publications that are cited on the other side, um, is that you see that it actually decreases with an increasing number of measurements. So, sort of you you're not doing better you're doing worse meaning it's not good for you to use more than two measurements because you sort of by using more than the two measurements you're actually losing something now if you would optimize over this distribution here which you can do over the distribution that you choose x and y uh, in all the cases that have been studied in these two papers and it's a bit hidden but if you look into these two papers it always will tell you, yeah, just use uniformly measurement one and two. And then you end up with the CHSH inequality and you play the optimal non-local game. So in other measures, it's known that you can beat the CHSH inequality. So for instance, if you look at the noise robustness of a Werner state, you know you can beat the CHSH inequality, but where maybe you need 40 settings or so in your Bell inequality. But this is a, it's a different measure. 
And even for this inequality where you can beat it, if you just look at the, if you measure on a maximally entangled state, no noise with M measurements, and you optimize over this distribution uh, that tells you which measurement you should perform with a certain probability, what it will tell you is just perform two measurements. That's the best. And this is kind of relevant because in this paper by, by Araujo and co-workers, they showed that the non-local game is sort of related, the optimal non-local game of, of a certain distribution is related to how many measurements you need if you want to be statistically significant uh, with some p-value that your violation of this non-local game cannot come after n measurements, and this I mean like measurement shots. Um, um, so how many measurement shots you need to be statistically significant. So this is sort of a maybe practical, also relevant question, why the CHSH inequality does work so well, but also maybe just a interesting question about these quantifiers, why they behave so differently. Yeah, that, that is kind of weird to me. That's why I, I wanted you to like go through it again, because- Yes, yes, thanks a lot I, for that. I, yeah, I, I know that there is like some notion of non-locality. I don't know if you've heard about full non-locality. Uh, full non-locality. No, yes. I think I'm not aware of the term. What does yeah, it mean? So, so uh, with that, I I'm no, I know that kind of CHSH is not the best in the sense that you can do better if you have a chain CHSH. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the full non-locality refers to the behavior in which if you try to decompose it in terms of like local and non-local part, ah, mm -hmm. uh, no matter how you optimize it, you only have a non-local part. Um, there, uh, it is known that if you increase the number of measurements, then you get a better and better. And mm -hmm. for non-locality also kind of uh, corresponds to like those perfect perfect games where you have like non-local games, which you can al always win. That's why I, I was surprised that uh, from this perspective, uh, you actually see it as it gives you the kind of the best. Yeah, so, so this is, yeah, it's also very surprising and not clear to me why it, it's the case or whether it's the case. But just, um, let's say, the numerics that I've seen in these papers or the examples, even going beyond numerics, they, they don't find a case where they can beat CHSH. It's not the main focus of these papers, but if you look through the numbers and the, the plots uh, they have in the papers, you see that I cannot beat CHSH, okay. which I find kind of interesting why it should be the case. And I've, before this work, had no idea. And now I still might have no idea, but at least the hope that it might be related to, to, this, to these bounds, because this is somehow the only difference that I'm aware of in terms of settings of measurements between non-locality and, and like, let's say steering or incompatibility, where it's, very easy, almost trivially, to beat two measurements. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for the question. Um, yeah. So I would already come to the summary. I have no idea how I do in time-wise. Um, but yeah. So what we have seen is that multiple measurements have a very rich structure, and that this distance-based approach just seems to be well, well suited. I mean, you saw I don't use any heavy framework. All I use is the triangle inequality and a good incompatibility quantifier in a sense, and then it works out nicely. Uh, it nicely means we get even tight bounds for a lot of relevant scenarios, meaning uh, mutually unbiased bases. And we can also get tight bounds for this incompatibility gain. Uh, yeah, here's a picture to maybe take home. And then with that, I before we maybe come to questions, I want to thank you and also announce something. Uh, we are organizing the YKIS conference uh, in Paris, which will be happening from 4th to 8th of November, um, which you can see here is our website, and you can submit your contribution there. Uh, you can also ask me later about it, but uh, you're more than welcome to, of course, uh, submit something there. Okay, thank you very much.
uh, that was a very very nice uh, talk. Now we have time for questions. Sazin is raised his uh, hand, of course. Sazin. Oh, I was. Yeah, I was actually. What to say? He was trying to clap. I'm guessing. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, maybe I will start then, because I, I also have one more question. Maybe I missed it uh, somewhere, but all you talked about here is a bipartite case. Can you also do the same for multipartite? So, I talked about bipartite somehow because, well, I talked about actually one partite, right? I talked about measurements. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, but then you kind of referred it to like the CHSH and steering and... Yes. Yeah. So this, in, in general, I don't see any problem to, to do it uh, more generally because what you, all you're using is that you have a probability in some probability space and then you can use triangle inequalities, you have this quantifier. So there's nothing particular about this bipartite case. What might be interesting and related to something which which I, I try to do currently is um, if you have measurements acting on more than one system, which you can have like well, like bell state measurements and so on, and you can try to define the notion of incompatibility there, uh, whether you get new effects um, re either regarding the number of measurements, but maybe also by looking on how they act on some subsystems. But yeah, normally incompatibility is just considered on, on one system. Yeah, okay, because this is kind of what I also got and it seems like a nice technique and uh, yeah, and especially like, because for me, I often you, uh, work with genuine multipartite non-locality, which is like yes. non-locality again, like, yeah, and uh, there it's very difficult to kind of analyze inequalities and yeah, and so uh, that would be interesting for me if you could yeah, so maybe, apply. Maybe regarding this uh, one part, I can share my screen again. I think you see now, yes? Yes, yes. Um, this picture here, which I mean, I'm not the first one to coming up with this, uh, with this picture for incompatible measurements. This is heavily inspired by the idea of general multipartite entanglement and general and multipartite non-locality, you can draw exactly the same picture for like bipartitions and entanglement, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, sorry, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. but, but you can, can do this. Um, it's just that I think this normal distance-based framework and using the triangle inequality there might not tell you too much. I don't know. We're using here very specifically that we can sort of have a sum of distances over the settings, but still it's somehow inspired by actually by this idea of, of multipartite uh, correlations, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot for the question. Okay, do we have more questions? Well, I have one. Uh, Lucas, can you think about any advantage in using entropic distances instead of geometric ones? Um, hmm. Okay, so for entropic distances, you don't have any general generalization or something like this of a triangle inequality, I guess, right? Well, you have data processing inequality and... Um, okay, yeah, you have data processing inequality, true. Uh, let me sh enter sharing again. Um, I'm not so sure. What would be interesting maybe is also to get, in some sense, non-trivial lower bounds. Mm -hmm. And with what I do, it's very clear that it somehow will only give you non-trivial upper bounds. But if you can get something with which tells you, ah, yeah, I can, I'm, I'm guaranteed to have at least this game, this would also be interesting. And there, I'm not sure what the right thing to do is and it might be that you have to use a completely different quantifier which might be for instance entropic quantifiers or i don't know robustnesses i have no idea 
you also use the uh, um, I mean you obtain tight bounds for poly matrices, but how about generalizations of poly matrices? So yes, um, <laughs> of is left you mean by generalizations uh, mutually unbiased bases, mm -hmm. like in higher dimensions, then it works. Mm -hmm. There's some other generalization in mind. So for for MUBs in, in a given dimension, let's say a prime dimension D. Uh, there we, we have non-trivial tightness results. We just come from the fact that in the literature there's nice results um, about the incompatibility of, of these MUBs. And again, we can make use of SDPs and characterize it this way. So, yeah, we, we use in this structure. Uh, you have a different generalization of Pauli matrices in mind, or was it what you mean? What you meant? I mean the Heisenberg Vio basis. Ah, the Heisenberg Vio basis. Um, so yeah, this gives you still the mutually unbiased basis in higher dimension, right? Mm -hmm. So this works. Okay, thank you. Uh, any more questions? Well, I think not. So we can finish for today. Lucas, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Um, Thanks a lot for inviting me. A pleasure to have you here and um, see you next time. Yes. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everybody.